It's Monday night football time. Steelers, Colts under the bright lights in Indianapolis. Our man Brian Batko is there on the scene. We're going to get you a full breakdown why the Steelers might be able to break out on offense sooner rather than later. All that and more right here on the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here today for Brian Batko. We're both at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. And welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast. We're here of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm Chris Carter. He's Brian Batko in there in Indianapolis. You can, As always, you can find this show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and especially on YouTube. Like this video if you see it on YouTube. Subscribe to this channel to get all of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette sports content, content right here. The North Shore Drive podcast is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but we have daily content coming out here all the time. Also, today's episode is brought to you by the AccraSure Fan Advantage Introducing the Astrid Fan Advantage, which gives you the power to project one of our post gazette Steelers beat writers into your home or office using augmented reality. You can get an exclusive pregame breakdown from the Steelers experts standing right in your living room. Get the latest insights on starting lineups, key matchups, and critical stats at post gazettecom slash fan advantage. No after downloads, just insider access to Steelers updates at post gazettecom slash fan advantage and get a real edge on this week's action. Brian, how's everything at the hotel in Indy? Everything's good, Chris. Um, you know, this is my first. I know Ray usually is the hotel podcast guy because he's <laughs> you know doing the the morning after show or whatever. But yeah, this is my first time doing it on the road. So hopefully, there's no incriminating evidence on the tables behind me. But uh, yeah, it's it's a little frigid in Indy, but that's the nice thing about Lucas Oil Stadium. We'll be watching indoors tonight. Indeed, you will. So as, as I understand it, there's no Indianapolis fans like hounding you as you come in, <laughs> trying to boo and hiss. To make yourself you're feeling comfortable on your way into staying. No, but I'll say this much: I was talking to my uh, my one friend who's a lifelong Steelers fan. Uh, went to college with him, and he lives out here in Bloomington now. And I asked him if he's going to go to the game tonight, and he said that the tickets were actually a, a little bit out of his range. So he wow. said ever since ever since Saturday took over, it seems like there's been a little bit of renewed interest here in Indy for the Colts. And um, I think jokingly, he said everybody wants to see Kenny Pickett back at the uh, the venue where he cemented himself as a first-round pick at the Combine. So um, we've got that storyline for us tonight as well. Actually, these next few games, you know, you think in, in terms of Kenny Pickett, and he's, he's got Lucas Oil Stadium tonight where he obviously you know, he threw at the Combine and impressed, arguably was the best uh, quarterback there uh, this season before the draft. Then next week, back to Atlanta where he did not play in the Peach Bowl, right? Um, <laughs> But could have. Uh, and then two weeks after that, back to Carolina, Bank of America Stadium, where he became a legend with the fake slides. Fake slide. so everything is Kenny Pickett, Chris. Well, let's talk about that with the offense, because the offense put up 20 points against the Saints, 30 points against the Bengals. Where yeah, they lost. really kind of put up 23 against okay. the Bengals. Okay, but that, that's fair. That's fair. They, 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 that's but, that. but, but still, 23 points. If you had told somebody that about two or three weeks ago, you'd have been like, I'll take it uh, because how bad the offense had been. This team, and you wrote an article about this earlier last week uh, talking about this, but this offense, it has taken some steps forward. The run game's gotten better. You've seen better, you know, this is back-to-back games where Kenny Pickett hasn't thrown an interception. Is this fool's gold right now, or is there something brewing with this offense that could lead to higher efficiency from this group? This is the the most tangible evidence I think we've had yet that they could be close to, as I put it in, in the headline, you know, not just breaking out, but maybe even finding a way to sustain success, if, if you want to call it the kind of cliche identity or whatever. But, um, you know, I, I look at a few a few different things. Um, number one is, yeah, I mean, it starts with Kenny Pickett, right? He's taking care of the ball better. Obviously, the next step is going to be to to mesh that kind of game manager style with you know, hitting on the the big plays when you need to and being more consistent with the accuracy, the timing with his receivers, the, the, you know, I think showing off the arm strength, something is, you know, something he's going to need to do too, to keep defenses honest. That's, that's going to be a big key tonight, frankly, against pretty good uh, Colts defense. And then beyond Pickett, um, I I think George Pickens uh, and the the way that they're utilizing him now, what what was everybody saying early in the year? You got to take more shots to George Pickens. You got to use him downfield. You got to open that up. They're doing that now. His average depth of target is 
right up there near the top of the league at, at this point. And I think he led all receivers last week against the Bengals. Now you could argue they need to one target him more and two hit on some of those, but they're at least trying to push the ball downfield to number 14. That should open things up for Deontay Johnson eventually. I'm not too worried about his mini slump. You know he's going to bounce back at some point. And then three, uh, Najee Harris. I mean, this is the second year in a row now where he looks stronger and even more effective as the calendar kind of flips to November and you get into those late season battles of attrition. You know, in yeah. Pittsburgh, it's cold. Um, you know, he's wearing down defenses. So back-to-back 90-plus yard games for him. Can they keep that going? Um, it's not going to be easy against the Colts, but even more so when we've had this discussion earlier in the season, I think there's tangible evidence that they're close and it's not just they're close because they say so. Right. And I I, I agree with that assessment that there, there are signs that things are, are trending upwards. I mean, also just looking at how Kenny Pickett's played, you know, one thing we've seen is there's times when pressure or even non-pressure, perceived, you know, perceived pressure that he thought was there would cause him to get erratic. He would he would kind of get happy feet in the pocket, and that would lead to some rushed plays that either led to interceptions or some big missed opportunities. And not that Kenny Pickett isn't missing opportunities right now, because he definitely is, <clears throat> but seeing him find guys across the field, and, and a little bit later we'll talk more about Pickens and Johnson and how they're working right now. But I think everyone wants to see, you know, the Steelers got seven games left. You know they 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 need to win six of them to keep a to keep a winning record th- th- this season and keep Mike Thomas streak alive. But I think the biggest thing everyone wants well, to see they tie, them, Chris. They could tie. That's right. They could get they play the Falcons to tie. We have a there's a storied history of the the Steelers and Falcons tying in NFL games. So this is true. Tommy Maddox with the yeah. tactical burst at the goal line pass. I forgot <laughs> all about that. Um, but uh, but 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 here's here's where I'm at with Kenny Pickett is that. None of that. Like, I think everyone would take Kenny Pickett finding his groove and getting into something that kind of carries him forward over whatever record the Steelers get. If he pro- if he shows real signs of progress that hey he could be the guy in, in in future seasons and in the next couple of seasons, I think that that's what everyone's looking for to see that breakout element of this offense. Yeah, and and that's the the growth that, that you're looking for from him. I mean, to your point there, I, I still think the. You know, the pocket presence, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to see him take some more strides. I think it, it has gotten better the last couple weeks. But, I mean, that's that innate ability that a quarterback kind of just has or he doesn't, right? I mean, you can you can work that, you can drill that, but it's the intangibles to a certain degree that come with playing the position. So, um, you know, you'd, you'd like to see uh, more of that from him. And, you know, it's not going to be – it's not going to be a linear trajectory. We know that. Plus yeah. – the, the opponents matter too. I mean, this is a, a difficult matchup tonight, even though the Colts record wise are impressive. Their defense is pretty good. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not really the play of the defense. I don't think that that ended the Frank Reich era. It was how the offense just became such a mess. So, um, you know, this is a tough one for Pickett. Atlanta next week should be a softer uh, landing spot. You would think you've still got two matchups with the Ravens who I, I know Trevor Lawrence went pew, 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 down the field on them at the end yesterday, but they're still the Ravens, right? You're still going to be playing these gritty AFC North games in, in Pittsburgh and Baltimore. So that won't be easy. I mean, even the Browns defense is, you know, it's soft, but, uh, you know, rivalry wise, th- those games are always feisty. So uh, it, it won't be you know, easy sledding for Pickett down the stretch, but that's what you're going to have to deal with year in and year out in this league. And, you know, as he continues to adjust to the learning curve of, of going from Pitt to the NFL, even as polished and, and pro ready as he was, going to have those ups and downs but yeah you're you're looking over these last uh you know what seven games that smooth out some of the downs and you know let's see let's see some more uh, you know ceiling with the ups if that makes sense indeed we do need to see more more a higher ceiling uh with, with some with some of these ups and seeing more progress we'll see how about that tonight but i want to talk more to you about the receiver situation because george pickens has been getting given more targets deontay johnson has not seen as many, and he's not seen as many opportunities. And when you look at the, the amount of money that he's getting paid, there's certainly questions about that. We'll get into those questions in a minute here on the North Shore Drive podcast of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. But first, we got to talk to you guys about liquid death. When you're out, whether you're out tailgating, you might see someone crushing tall boys all day long and staying completely sober. And you're probably thinking, what is going on with that guy over there? Well, chances are they're most likely just drinking. Of a tall can of Liquid Death. Liquid Death is a Mountain Spring water brand that comes in a tall boy can, looks just like a Miller Lite, 
but it's so refreshing and healthy for you because it's getting you fresh water. You put it in a cooler, you put it in a fridge, it comes out ice cold. And it's called Liquid Death because it's here to murder your thirst and it's here to murder plastic pollution. They donate 10% of the profits from every can sold to help kill plastic pollution on the planet. Plus, they just flat out taste great. There's no plastic residue left over from some of the, the, the water bottle brands out there. You get straight from the can, fresh water right to your mouth. It's awesome. Go get Liquid Death right now at your local Target, 7-Eleven, or County Fair, or find a Liquid Death retailer near you with their store locator tool. Look at it at liquiddeath.com slash shore. That's liquiddeath.com slash shore. We're also brought to you by Valley Pool and Spa. Wouldn't it be nice if the holidays were stress-free? A hot tub, a swim spa, or a sauna from Valley Pool and Spa will help you feel like it is. Relax and soak in a hot tub or a swim spa from Valley Pool and Spa before the snow flies. And you can refresh and rejuvenate in a Finlayo sauna that is sure to melt your stress away faster than Frosty in Aruba. Save big now on all in-stock hot tubs and swim spas by visiting valleypoolspa.com. That's valleypoolspa.com. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, I'm Chris Carter. He's Brian Badko. Brian, in your mailbag that you did that you did uh, for the Steelers for the Post Gazette. You um you talked. One of the questions was, has George Pickens supplanted Deontay Johnson as wide receiver one? And I, I think the obvious answer to that is obviously no. But it does ju- jump into the serious question as far as what is the priority of passing in this Steelers offense? Because I, I think for years Steelers fans, the Steelers were in a position, and not just Steelers, but the Steelers were in a position themselves where Ben Roethlisberger could be like, you know what, this is my offense. I've been here for over a decade. I'm going to pick and choose where I want to attack at certain times. With a rookie, you kind of have to funnel where they're supposed to go with the ball throughout throughout a game to pick at certain weaknesses and to eliminate, you know, them kind of, you know, Kenny Pickett getting lost in the sauce with too many options. And with that, of, of late, since the bye, we've seen, like you said, you wrote, you talked about George Pickens' average depth of targets of up, but it's also his total targets are up, and Deontay Johnson's are less. Kenny Pickett gave some interesting words about that, but about what you know, what's going on with Deontay Johnson. What's your outlook as far as you know Deontay Johnson's situation right now, and whether or not he'll become more of a focus in the next few weeks? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's pretty similar to the conversation we've had the last couple of years with the Steelers receiving core, right? Except now, in this discussion, you know, Chase Claypool has been replaced by George Pickens. Right. Deontay Johnson is still, you know, I, he's still the guy who's the most targeted. Uh, receiver over the course of the season. I, I don't think that that's going to change drastically, but I, I suppose it, it comes down to the philosophical question of like, is your number one receiver the guy that gets thrown to the most? Is it the most physically impressive and talented player? Is it just whoever makes the most plays for you? And, you know, we've gone from Juju kind of being that guy for the Steelers to Deontay Johnson, you know, pretty clearly supplanting him. And, you know, obviously he got the second contract. Uh, from the Steelers. So uh, that tells me that, you know, it's it's still going to be a situation where, you know, he's the first read a lot of the times and we know he gets open. I mean, the, all the analytics and, and stats tell us how often he gets open. But the storyline this week with the Steelers passing game was Kenny Pickett basically saying, we're going to, we got to take what the defense gives us guys. You know, we're not going to force it to to him or anybody. And, you know, teams are, are bracketing him. They're, they're paying a lot of attention to him. So, uh, you know, I assume there has to be some frustration uh, on Johnson's part. You know, he's he's made some incredible plays this season and, and certainly over the course of his career. But he's also missed some chances to make some big plays. So uh, it's it's not just, uh, you know, a factor of what the offense is trying to do or how defenses are playing him. You know, he, he needs to uh, to pick it up as well. So I think Pickens is the most purely talented receiver. Um, you know, there's more that goes into playing the position than size, ball skills, you know, you, you've got to be a technician to some degree. Obviously, Johnson has that in his repertoire, but, uh, you know, maybe there's a 1A and a 1B. Maybe, maybe they can be really balanced between those two guys, and Johnson can work underneath and move the chains, and Pickens can go downfield and, and be the big play guy. So, uh, you know, it is it is streamlined to a degree for Pickett now that Claypool is gone, not doing much with the Bears, I might add, and you're, you're over the middle uh, field stretching, you know, kind of slot pass catcher is, is Pat Fryermuth. And, you know, last week he led all tight ends in, in targets and yards, I believe, against the Bengals. And, and that to me is such a big part of this is because 
the Steelers have to be thinking forward. And I'm not just talking about draft picks and stuff like that. I'm talking about the guys who are on the roster right now. Who's going to be here for the long term? You know, Deontay Johnson signed for, you know, for what, two, three more years after this. But, you know, at the same time, like you're looking at like, okay, who are the guys that are going to build with Kenny Pickett? Your hope right now for this roster is that you keep maybe a lineman or two, but you're reinvesting in that offensive line. You're not keeping all those guys for the next eight to 10 years around Kenny Pickett. Uh, but you're hoping Kenny Pickett emerges. You're hoping he develops a connection with George Pickens, Pat Frymuth, and Najee Harris. And that that sort of core, I mean, you can have other pieces, like say Kevin Dotson improves upon his game and you know is able to kind of stay injury free a little bit uh, down the stretch here. Maybe he's a guy like, you know what, for a fourth round guard, we need, you know, the Steelers had Ramon Foster and Alejandro Villanueva, two undrafted guys. You can have the, those type of guys around superstar players that you either draft or, or, or pay a lot of money in free agency for. I, you, but, but you need those core guys to build with Kenny Pickett moving forward. And I think, like you said, you, you want to see George Pickens developing more of a connection. You want to see Pat Farmuth developing, developing more of a connection. And again, this is why it's made the, the Chase the Chase Claypool trade made so much sense and continues to look like an absolute steal. Because at this point, Brian, if the draft was today, the Bears would give the Steelers the thirty third pick in the NFL draft because the the Dolphins have you know forfeited their pick because of their punishment, which moves them up. That's basically a first round pick at this point. And, you know, speaking of the receivers, I would be very curious to see, can the Steelers young receiving core, and I guess Deontay Johnson's, he's not quite young anymore, but can they outplay the young group that the Colts are, are rolling with right now? I mean, Michael Pittman Jr. is is a really good player on the outside for them. Alec Pierce is a rookie out of Cincinnati who's made some, some big plays. And those two guys were drafted, um, you know, really close to where, the Steelers took Chase Claypool and George Pickens. So uh, it's a little bit of a parallel track there with those guys. Can can Deontay Johnson and George Pickens make more plays than Pittman and Pierce? Paris Campbell's a pretty good slot receiver for the Colts as well. Um, you know, it's it's going to be a, a key to the game. I mean, how, how each team's offense fares against the, the opposing secondary. You know, the Colts secondary has – Stephon Gilmore, um, you know, he's he's still a, playing at a really high level, even at age 32. The Steelers don't really have a corner who is is taking other teams' best receivers yeah. out of games. You know, they've, they've gotten toasted uh, by T. Higgins, by A.J. Brown. Brown, by Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis Gabe, in that yeah. Bills game. So uh, that's that's been a, a weak point for them all season. Now we'll see how they match up with, you know, these, these young Colts receivers who – are big bodied guys and, you know, they're contested catch specialists. So uh, Levi Wallace, Cam Sutton, James Pierre, if he's involved much, all those guys will have their work cut out for them. I think they certainly will. Uh, this will be an interesting game, you know, with, with this. So you talked about the matchups here. The Colts were known for their rushing offense last year. It hasn't been so much this year. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been interesting to see how them work, but they still do have a defense. I, I do think these defenses are going to be the strong points of both teams in this game. We'll get more into that in that matchup and that breakdown in just a minute here on the North Shore Drive podcast. So don't go anywhere. But first, we got to talk to you guys about Yinzas in the Berg. Yinzas in the Berg is the number one place to go for all your Pittsburgh sports apparel, accessories, and much more much more. So Yinzers, listen up. With the Steelers campaign well underway, the, the, the Penguins are back and going. It's time to show your support for your black and bold. And it's easy to do so by going to Yinzers in the Berg that has two legendary shops in the Strip District. Plus, they have an online store that's always growing in the merchandise that they're selling. Yinzers in the Berg is the ultimate place to go to for Pittsburgh sports apparel, accessories, and much, much more. They'll see you in the Strip District or you can go online to YinzersPGH.com. That's YinzersPGH.com for all your Pittsburgh sports apparel. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, I'm Chris Carter. He's Brian Batko. Let's get into this matchup now. The Steelers play the Colts. Uh, the Colts four six and one. Um, of course, with Jeff Saturday as, as as the new head coach. Brian, is this is this a really big factor? Do you think in this game is the fact that there's a new head coach because they won their first game with them and they almost upset the Eagles last week. You know, this is a team that I think a lot of people pegged to be like, you know what, they're about to lose out because they got a new head coach. It's Jeff Saturday. He's never, he's literally never coached in the NFL or in college football before. He had a losing record as a high school coach. And here he is one on one with the Colts. Like you said, people seem to be excited about him. Granted, he's a Colts legend for being part of the Peyton Manning era and a center in that era. But still, is that something that 
I, you think it's being overplayed or underplayed uh, as far as the coaching matchup of the brand new Jeff Saturday and the long least, the long established Mike Tomlin? I, I think it could be underplayed in the sense that, yeah, the Colts lately have been playing better than their record. I mean, it seems like they are leaning on Jonathan Taylor a little bit more. We know that, you know, the, the quarterback situation for them was a mess early this season. They pivot from Matt Ryan to Sam Ellinger, pivot back to Ryan now that Jeff Saturday has taken over. So, you know, it, it's been a disappointing season here in middle America. I think we lost um, for oh, Saturday himself and his personality, or is it personal pride from a group with a lot of veterans like you know, DeForest Buckner, Grover Stewart on the defensive side of the ball uh, up front, Stephon Gilmore in the back end on offense, Jonathan Taylor. I mean, coming off the season he had last year, Quentin Nelson, you know, this, this offensive line is, not playing as well as you mentioned, but I mean, they still have some experience there. Um, you know, I, I do think it's a factor uh, that just that they've looked like a different team a little bit. And, you know, the Steelers have, you know, they have pride in that locker room as well, but I think it's tougher to, to take that on the road with you. It's, it's going to be, um, you know, a difficult game tonight against a, a team that's evenly matched, I think on paper, talent wise, everything like that. Um, and you're right. I mean, the, the defenses are, are going to be huge in this one. I don't know how the Colts are going to move the ball if they can't run it. I think Matt Ryan is, you know, he, he could be in for a long day against TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith. Can yeah. he Can he push the ball downfield? Will he have time to do it? Um, I don't know. I, I don't feel great about predicting either offense to score a bunch of points, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens if, you know, if there's some big plays made, some coverage busts. Uh, maybe that could be the, the kind of X factor in this game. Yeah, I, I do think that's an X factor is making sure like last week, I felt like the Steelers biggest problem was their role players were getting exploited uh, by the Bengals in going after the right guys. They, they stayed away from targeting Minka Fitzpatrick. They targeted him on the first drive of the game. It led to a, a third down stop. And after that, they, they made sure to never go his way again. And they were getting the ball out quickly to try to avoid TJ Watt having an impact on the game. Uh, but can the but can the Colts do that. This is an offense with Alec Pierce and Michael Pittman Jr. as their top receiving options. Uh, like you said, they, they're built through the running game, but Quentin Nelson hasn't even looked himself. It's not just the fact that they're the 26th best rushing offense, 24th when you count yards per attempt, uh, but the like I just watching them on tape. Quentin Nelson used to be the behemoth that swallowed everyone. If, if you he would take yeah, on yeah. dimension. Would you say? But besides Cam Hayward, Cam Hayward does own that man. I've seen, I've, I've seen, I've seen that before. But there were so many guys that if you, oh, Quentin Nelson is going to win that matchup. Now he's he's losing like one on ones against journeyman defensive linemen, and it's like, whoa, what has happened here? And to me, that was part of what maybe the problem really was that that that, that Jim Irsay might have seen with Frank Reich. Um, you know, I, I'm not privy to everything that's going on with the Colts organization, but. You know, Even though you're a, wearing a Colts hoodie right now, right? This is a Cheney hoodie. Oh, don't yeah, don't you was, dare. I don't thought that you, was a horseshoe. No, don't you dare. That's Cheney you, a big you in the background. The first HBC. You get it right, sir. Don't disrespect my my, my I alma mater. See a C, I see a C. I see a, a little it you looked see like H and a Y. Where's the H and a Y in Colts? Colts? And I see Colts colors. I was a little <laughs> I was a little concerned that you were making a brazen attempt to back the opposing team this week. You know, I, I thought about this when I put on this hoodie today. I was like if someone sees me on the show and the, and Brian, you know, I thought about this. And of course, you bring it up here as we're doing a breakdown. Nothing gets uh, past me. I'm I'm observing, Chris. <laughs> You're the dogged reporter, Brian Beck, go asking the hard questions. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, you know, I'll also be curious to see how do the Colts kind of defend Pat Fryermuth. I mean, we we mentioned yeah. earlier that you know he's been a go-to guy. For Kenny, any tight end is always going to be a quarterback's best friend, but especially a rookie quarterback. So, I mean, do they do they trust Kenny Moore to try to match up with him? They're they're really good slot corner who hasn't been as productive this year, but um, you know, still one of the best at his position in the league. He'll come in on a blitz occasionally. You got to look out for that if you're Kenny Pickett. That's where that pocket presence is is going to come uh, come into play, Chris. I mean, if Kenny Moore comes flying in off the edge on block, no one picks him up. You know, Kenny's going to have to spin out of that. And you know, either extend the play or get the ball out of his hand quick enough uh, to you know to catch them sleeping. So, um, does Bo Bobby Okereke? He's been a pretty good coverage linebacker. For yeah, he has been. Does, does he match up with Pat Fryermuth? So they do have a lot of answers on that side. I mean, Yannick Ngakwe is is always a tough test on the edge. He's been on a bunch of different teams now. The Steelers have seen him. I don't think he's hurt them too badly, from what I can recall. But 
Um, you know, he does lead the, the Colts in sacks, I believe, and DeForest Buckner's tough up front. So yep. Jason Cole, you know, I was talking to him in the locker room on Friday. He said, this is going to be a big game for execution because his point is that, I mean, obviously every game is, but his point is the steel, the Colts defense, you know, they're not real exotic. They kind of just do what they do. Yep. You got to just beat your man, win your battle. And my, my key matchup in our scouting report this week that you can find on the post because that website is mm-hmm. Najee Harris versus Zaire Franklin, who leads the mm-hmm. NFL and tackles. I mean, he's not a big name guy. Najee didn't even know his name. He called him 44. I believe <laughs> well, I don't, he might have known his name, but he just called him 44. I mean, it, it's not like Shaq Leonard. So, I mean, he's out for the year for the Colts. Yeah, uh, they're, they're star inside linebacker. But uh, Zaire Franklin and Bobby Okariki have been, you know, playing pretty well at, at those inside linebacker spots. Franklin's actually questionable now with an illness. So right. maybe we'll find something out by the time you hear this, whether he's in or not. But if he's in and even if he's not Okariki, the other guy, I mean, Harris is going to have to make some people miss and he's, he's going to have to probably win some open field matchups for himself if, if he's going to keep up this nice string of, uh, of yards per carry. Indeed, they're going to have to win, and it's going to be on the offensive line too. You know, can 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 they get him the iso the isolated one on one opportunities to win right. in the hole? That hasn't happened a lot in the yeah, first. The hasn't been letting it get to the the second and third level much. I mean, that's yeah. why they've been one of the league's best run defenses, and the Steelers have been one of the league's best run defenses. So, mm-hmm. going to be kind of fire against fire in that sense. I agreed entirely because if the Steelers, I do think this comes down to which defense cracks first. You got to hope that if you're the Steelers, that Najee Harris kind of gets more cracks at you know getting one-on-one opportunities in the hole to be able to beat the beat the line, linebackers than say Jonathan Taylor does, and that that, that whose group holds up the who holds up the best. Um, that's going to be a big play, play out here, but also which which passing offense yields the least turnovers. You know, Stephon Gilmore still playing very well for the Colts right now. Uh, granted, you know the guys around him aren't superstars, but Julian Blackman, Rodney McLeod, those are those are two good veterans. Kenny Moore hasn't been as good, but you know th- that's a group that's going to challenge you. And the Steelers, the Steelers secondary again, like you got to limit the big plays, but also I think it could come down to when Matt Ryan's in, in a third and long situation, make him pay for it. You know, not just the pass rush, but when he he throws a pass, if there's an opportunity you got to intercept it you know you go back to that Jets loss where they dropped at least two interceptions that Zach Wilson threw right into their hands if they catch either one of them maybe this is a maybe we're looking at a different season I think all the same thing happened against the Dolphins you can't miss on those opportunities in this game it could come down to those type of moments Brian with that being said you said, you said your biggest matchup what is your final score prediction for this game yeah I, I might be predicting too much scoring wise here but I'm gonna go Colts 23, Steelers 22. Sort Whoa. Of weird score. I, I, you know, I don't feel great about picking the Colts because I do think that Matt Ryan is going to be under siege all evening. Mm-hmm. However, you know, Joe Burrow didn't really have to use his legs much last week. So, I mean, even if, if Ryan is a statue back there, which he is, mm-hmm. uh, if he can get the ball out quick and allow his playmakers to – uh, kind of run after the catch. And, you know, if, if the Steelers defense does start to, sh- is if they're ever going to start to show some cracks, it would probably be against Jonathan Taylor. So, um, yeah, I, I don't feel great about it, but I've been picking the Steelers a lot. And clearly it, that has not been a good strategy for this season. So fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So I'm, I'm going to go with the Colts at home in this one, Chris. What about you? I'm going 24-10 Steelers. I think this is the week that the defense stands up. They get a, a, a good group of turnovers that kind of help the offense. The offense won't crack it until late, but I do think in the late in the third quarter, mid fourth quarter is when you start to see like, you know, them to get some scores to kind of because this will I think this will be a close game at 24 to 10. It'll be like it'll be like 14-10 for a while. And then you'll see a couple turnovers and a couple or a big player two on offense that gets them those extra 10 points at the end. So it looks like a bigger depth, a bigger gap than it actually was uh, going into like the later part of the game. So that being said, you got the Colts. I got the Steelers Monday night football. He's Brian Batgill. He'll be right there. Luke Soil Stadium covering any everything there with our team of uh, Ray Fittipaldo, Jerry Dulac, and everyone else with the Steelers team there from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Stay tuned for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, post-gazette.com to get all of the content coming from Monday Night Football as our team is there live. I'm Chris Carter here with the North Shore Drive Podcast. We'll have more for you breaking things down on Wednesday. We're going to try to get Ray Fittipato on, on the Wednesday episode. We missed him because of the holiday. We're going to try to get him back on so we can get his perspective on things, uh, especially with whatever direction this game heads in. Again, from Chris Carter, Brian Backo, thanks for listening to the North Shore Drive Podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcast, YouTube. Like this channel if you like this video if you saw it subscribe to this channel to get all of our daily content here we'll be back on wednesday talking more about your pittsburgh steelers
Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you're watching this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down below in the description.